Well, as you probably know, there are a lot of feminists who are Bible scholars. Uh, yes. Well, okay. So the Bible itself isn't. <laughs> I know. But, but see, see, this is, verses, yeah, but like. You often pick a lot of verses that show that women are important. So those 10,000 children you just mentioned dying, they're just going to get compensated in the afterlife. God's going to go, here you go, guys. I know that was a little inconvenient, but, you know. It's all good. I'm all powerful. We're loving. I know what I'm doing. I rarely get really angry at somebody during a debate, but this one made me angry. When, when I do get angry, it's usually about theodicy. I think the problem is not the Bible. Uh, the Bible doesn't do any harm. The Bible is a book, you know, and books don't harm people. People harm people. And I You're think. You're pro gun. I'm pro gun. Guns don't hurt people, people do. Why hello my fellow apes, welcome to the Rational Roundtable. Our guest today is Dr. Bart Ehrman, a distinguished scholar and author renowned for his groundbreaking research in biblical studies and early Christianity. As a leading authority in the field, Dr. Ehrman has written and edited 30 books, including three college textbooks, and he has also authored six New York Times bestsellers, such as Misquoting Jesus and How Jesus Became God. We are honored to have him here today to share his profound insights. Please enjoy our conversation. Dr. Bart Ehrman, it is a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for this opportunity. Oh, thanks for having me. So to begin, would you kindly mind expanding upon your new course? It's titled, Why I Am Not a Christian, How Leaving the Faith Led to a Life of More Meaning and Purpose. Yeah, so um, if you're, for the listeners who don't know, I'm a, I'm a scholar of the New Testament, and I'm, I'm a bit of a strange bird because I'm a New Testament scholar who's an atheist. Um, and in my course, uh, it'll be a four lecture course, uh, 45 minutes with a long question Q&A period um, where people can ask me about any of it. I talk about how um, I started out as a Christian and was a committed evangelical Christian for uh, for a number of years and was actually a fundamentalist going to Moody Bible Institute and and how how eventually because of my scholarship I started realizing that the Bible was was a problematic was problematic and it, that in the sense that it clearly to me was not inerrant I came to realize and and then how I wrestled with that how what I meant to be a Christian without believing every literal everything in the Bible was literally true and how I remained a Christian for years until finally I, I decided I had to leave the faith. And so my part of the course is talking about my own journey away from faith and why it happened as a way of helping people who themselves are having doubts for one reason uh, or another. Um, but I also talk about the kind of trauma that's involved with leaving the faith, uh, how that can be so emotionally wrenching and what kind of fears I had uh, when I was thinking about that I just couldn't be a believer anymore. And uh, and um, now I talk about what, you know, how these fears were never actually realized in the sense that, you know, I thought, that, you know, if I, if I don't believe in God, why would I have any reason for ethics? I'd have no moral compass. I would just, and, you know, or if I, if I don't believe in God, why, if I think that this material world is all there is, what's the point of living? And why, why would I find any meaning and purpose in life if this is it? And, and those were, those were questions I had. And it turns out that my fears were misplaced and that, in fact, I find more meaning and purpose now as somebody who thinks that this life is all there is than I, than I did before as a believer. So I'm not trying, I'm not going to be trying to convert anybody to my views or uh, deconvert them from whatever their faith position is or uh, anything like that. I'm going to be explaining my 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 journey and um, deal with issues that people have had to deal with when they've had doubts about their faith. So it sounds like it's going to be an emotional and personal uh, take on the journey that you've had through the trauma and, you know, the supposed nihilism, etc., rather than just hard, hard logic, if you will. Is that is that fair? Uh, I think that is fair because I don't think hard logic can solve the problem of whether there's a God or not, or whether there's a greater superior being in the universe or not. That's, this is not a logical equation. It's not a you know it's not a question that logic can answer any more than math can answer, or that engineering can answer, or that chemistry can. You can't answer the questions of God are theological questions, uh, and you could see them as philosophical questions. And so it's not a hardcore logic where I like give a logical argument. There's no God. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. And if somebody does say it works like that, they don't know how it works. So I, it's not going to be that kind of, that kind of thing. It, it will be emotional, but it's also going to be fact fact-based too, because I'm going to talk about facts that one has to wrestle with 
if one's a believer. Uh, they're the same facts one has to wrestle with if they're not a believer. But there, you know, there are certain facts about the Bible that make it very, very hard to believe that it's an infallible revelation from God. And they're very, they're facts about the development of Christianity that make you suspect that in fact it's a historical human development rather than a divinely driven development, etc. And yeah, so there, so there are biblical issues, philosophical issues, all sorts of things. Well, for everyone listening, you can find a link to Dr. Ehrman's course below. Just click on that. It will take you to a landing page and you can get more information. Highly recommend it. So you said about there are some difficult facts that you've got to chew on if you're a Christian. And I think that this will lead to a, a decent question, I hope. So let's start with a bit playful. If you had to list the top five reasons you're not a Christian, what would they be? Well... Um, the very top reason is that I don't believe there's a supernatural power in the universe that is uh, that is actively in in the world or active in the world at all. And if there's no God in that sense, then I don't think it makes sense for me to call myself a Christian. Um, I mean, I'll just interrupt myself to say that I, I consider myself a Christian in one sense because I do try to follow what I understand to be the teachings of Jesus about how to live in relationship to other people. But I don't I don't believe that Jesus is the son of God who died for the sins of the world, because I don't think that there's God. And so there can't be a son of God. <laughs> and so um, so the first thing is there's there's no I don't believe there's there's a God. I don't believe that there are any supernatural powers in the world. It's the second thing. I think that there are material. This is a material world. I am. Um, I'm convinced by the by the approaches of science to the world rather than the approaches of theology. I'm not a I'm not a scientist, I'm not a theologian, I just but th those are my my personal proclivities. Um, I think the world makes sense under the scientific model better than it does under a theological model, whether it comes to why we're here in the first place or how we got here through evolution and through Big Bang and, create and all that, rather than creation and, and Adam and Eve. Um, I think there are problems with knowing what Jesus said and did. I do think that it's pretty clear that you can show historically that Jesus um, was a, I mean, I think he was a brilliant teacher, and I think that he was a great moral teacher. Uh, I don't think that anybody really follows his moral teachings today. <laughs> if I'm writing a book about that now, about what he really taught and how, but I, but I also think he made mistakes in what he said. And so I think that um, that's a reason for doubting, uh, doubting something of the faith. Um, the um, the uh, I don't think that um, that the, you can make sense of the development of Christian theology um, apart from uh, conting human contingency and history. You know, where do you get the doctrine of the Trinity from? That kind of thing. And the final thing, the big the big thing for me is the problem of suffering. I think that there's so much pain and suffering in the world that the Christian message ultimately does not make sense to me. Now that's fair play. So it sounds to me that you were essentially describing yourself as what's known as a cultural Christian. Would you reject that label? That I am now, you mean? Yeah, like a cultural Christian. So that would be to say that you don't believe in that Jesus resurrected, but you really appreciate the message of Jesus. You said yourself that you live up to, or you try to live up to some of his teaching, if not all of it, and you appreciate the Christian message. So culturally you live uh, according to maybe not the edicts, but certainly the messages you see it, um, similar to how there's lots of secular Jews. Oh, yeah, that, that's not a bad comparison. I, I think that, I think, you know, the problem with knowing Jesus' teachings is a historical problem. Uh, and I think that, you know, it's important to, when I say that I try to follow the teachings of Jesus, I mean, as a historian, I have to reconstruct what I think those were. I don't simply like quote Bible verses and say, okay, that's what Jesus taught. It's actually far more complicated than that because our sources are so contradictory and are, uh, are written later by people who didn't know Jesus, writing decades later in a different language in different parts of the world. And so historians have to reconstruct what they think Jesus really taught. But when I do that as a historian, I try to come try to figure out what his basic message was. And there are large parts of the message that I agree with. And they are the parts of the, oddly enough, many of the parts of the message that I think actually do go back to Jesus are ones that most of his followers aren't aren't very interested in today. Um, at least you know, in, in, North America, in the United States right now, most Christians think that one of the main things Jesus taught was about abortion. It's absolutely false. 
priest that didn't say a word about abortion. And so when you look at what he did teach, it has to do with like helping the poor and taking care of the needy and being concerned for those who are oppressed and outcast and not simply welcoming those who are in your own community or in your own nation, uh, but welcoming others. These are things a lot, a lot of Christians don't want to hear. They want to hear abortion and gun. Yeah, I guess in their mind, they would say that um, because they see life starting at conception, they would say that that's the oppression of the the absolute maximal state of the innocent. And so they're trying to fight against that oppression. One of the things that I found quite peculiar, uh, almost to a hilarious degree, is that I think there is as many Christians, um, there's, a, there's as many types of Christianity as there are Christians, because they say that they're preaching, the you know they, they enjoy the message of Jesus, but it just so happens to be that this Christian and this Christian have a mutually exclusive and jointly exhaustive view of what, uh, what Jesus is teaching. Um, but yeah, that's very interesting on the cultural front. I'll, I'll move to the next question, and that is, um, do you believe that the Bible has done more harm than good in the world, and why? Um, no, I don't. I don't think so. I think that um, I think the problem is not the Bible. Uh, the Bible doesn't do any harm. The Bible is a book, you know, and books don't harm people. People harm people. And I You're think pro gun. I'm pro gun. Guns don't hurt people. People do. <laughs> Bible doesn't hurt people. <laughs> people do. Yeah. Well, the problem in both cases are the people. Uh, I don't think that you should. I mean, I I am not a <laughs> I'm not a big believer in uh, thinking that I, that my constitution supports the right to carry uh, assault rifles. I mean, so that's not my view. Um, but the Bible actually, um, nobody gets killed by having a Bible. Um, so the Bible itself cannot harm anybody. It's a book. It's not a gun. A gun can harm people. Couldn't you say that the Bible, because it has verses that tell you to stone homosexuals and to mistreat homosexuals, that it does really act as the gun in this situation? Or would you say that that's an unfair assessment? Well, I'd say it's a misinterpretation of the Bible, for one thing. Even though it like explicitly says stone well, homosexuals? It doesn't say anything about homosexuals. Homosexuality is a modern phenomenon that's based on on uh, orientation, understandings of orientation that came about after Freud. The ancient people didn't have any understanding of homosexuality. I mean, so any understand orientation at all. So it's just to think that the Bible condemns homosexuality is to say that the Bible was written in the 20th century when there was such a thing as understanding what homosexuality was. So when the Bible says if a man lie with another man as he would with a woman, is that not it describing homosexual practice? It's it's describing same sex relations between men. Yes, that's not homosexual. And, and okay, so it's still saying, in this case, you could you could rejig the objection I'm issuing here then to saying uh, you could use the Bible to justify saying that that man cannot sleep with that man. That's right. Because the Bible says so. No, that's right. Yeah. No, my point, here's my point. So I, I didn't quite get there, but my point is this. The people who are interested in, in stoning homosexuals would be interested in doing that whether there was a Bible or not. Because people, people are using the Bible in order to implement their own harmful views. That doesn't mean the Bible's at fault. I'm not, look, I'm not a believer in the Old Testament. It's not like I'm saying we should accept the Old Testament. I'm saying the problem is the people who misuse the Bible. It's not the Bible. I mean, so, look, look where, where there are societies without the Bible, you have just as much violence and hatred and oppression. So it's not the Bible doing it. It's people doing it. Do you not think that when we look at Abrahamic faiths and where they have influence in cultures, you have a particularly high rate of homophobia? Or do you think it's just the same in every culture? Or do you... Because that's where I would get the inference that it's not helpful that this book that people think are either written or inspired by God has these explicit verses. And that the way that you have to navigate that space is to go, look, Jesus said, love thy neighbor, and that supersedes these otherwise explicit verses. For me, it's quite obvious that this Bible does, well, what to about, some extent. What about, what, about Eastern, what about East Asian countries where it's illegal? So if we take, uh, say, India and its views on homosexuality, um, do you not think that India has 
they are you're right about the homophobia across the world but don't you think that it's particularly bad in in uh, western countries because of the influence of abrahamic faith i think it's pretty bad in soviet union oh yeah that's that's definitely true well, I mean, I, that's my point is that look, you know look, i'm I'm not saying we should implement the Bible, Bible's laws. I'm saying that the the that the, the the horrible things that people do in our world, they're going to do whether they've got a Bible or not. And they so that, that's my point. It's not that I mean, the Bible doesn't do more harm than I mean, you know, is it, the Bible doesn't the Bible doesn't hurt anybody. It's people who misuse the Bible that hurt people. Got you. So it's like used as a justification. That makes sense. So I'll move on to the next question. Um, in your opinion, what's the biggest misconception Christians have about their own religion? Um, my sense is that the biggest misconception uh, is that most Christians think that their views are the views taught by Jesus. Um, and in almost no case is that true. I don't know of any Christian denomination today that practices the religion that Jesus himself practiced. Um, and this gets back to your abortion thing. The Christians think that, you know, that the abortion, that they're just, you know, that, that since conception starts at birth, that they're, they're dealing with that oppression. And that's precisely something Jesus never said, or the Bible never says. So that's my point is that, that people uh, interpret their views as being the views that go back to Jesus and his apostles. And it's never the case. Do you think any of them interpret it correctly? And if so, could you point to a group that gets close to that approximation? Well, it depends what you mean by interpret it correctly. I mean, the, the Bible is a big book, and there are you know m- you know millions of passages in the Bible, and a lot of people get many of the passages correct. But if you if your idea is when I, when I was an evangelical, for example, when I was an evangelical, I belonged to a church that considered itself a New Testament church, which meant it it was it understood that it was following the guidelines. For what it meant to be a Christian, as found in the New Testament, um, and um, <laughs> it, it didn't. <laughs> I mean, even today, when people say things like, you know, you have these churches, like in America right now, the United Methodist Church became the, the disunited Methodist Church. They split split over uh, LGBTQ issues. Can you have a gay pastor or not? And many people insist, no, you can't. It's in the Bible. A woman cannot run a church. It's there. And yes, that's there. It's also there that women have to wear head coverings and cannot speak in church. Well, we don't follow that. That's just cultural. Well, okay, fine. But if that's cultural, why isn't the women preaching in church not cultural? You know what I'm saying? It sounds, yeah, yeah. It, it sounds to me that really... You're, you're expressing the, the, the edicts that are issued in the Bible and any other religious text. Um, it really doesn't matter how much emphasis is put on any particular claim because the people wielding the Bible are going to wield it according to their own biases and their own prejudice. Is, and it, but see, That's very unintuitive to me because I find that if I pick up the Bible and it has a lot of verses that seem to be screaming that women are subordinate to men, um, I feel like I'd have like a not just a justification, but God himself has justified this. The reason I have this bias, the reason I have this view, well, it makes sense now because the big guy upstairs says so. It's in the Bible. It's saturated. You find it in Genesis even. It sounds like what you're saying here is that it, it's not. it really isn't about what's being said in the books. It's entirely to do with the bias of people and they could read whatever they want into it with equal measure of validity. Is that is that fair? Well, as you probably know, there are a lot of feminists who are Bible scholars. Uh, yes. Well, okay. So the Bible itself isn't. <laughs> I know. But, but, so see, this is, verses, yeah, but like. You often pick a lot of verses that show that women are important and that women have equal rights with men. You can go to the New Testament, which says that there was a woman apostle who was superior to Paul. You can go to the New Testament to talk about how women are equal in Christ. You can look, you can do anything with the book. What you do with the book has to do with your presuppositions. Yeah, I guess and maybe I'm failing to articulate myself. The, the problem for me is that when you get a Christian that's pro-woman um, and you get a Christian that's, you know, no woman is subordinate. Likewise, if you get a Christian that's like, no, being gay is fine. Jesus is fine with that. And you get a Christian that's saying, no, Jesus is absolutely not OK with being gay. 
by my light, the problem is, is that one of them is very much succeeding in the theological scriptural battle because they have verses that are so much, that it's really explicit. Whereas those that are fighting against it, normally they're coming at it from the 20th century on, such as with feminism and the move with um, uh, a, a bigger push towards um, a presence of feminism in Christianity. But two, they just don't have the verses. But I don't want to traverse the same... Um, well, I'll just say... I understand, no, look, I completely understand your view, but it's because you're hearing these verses from people who are quoting them all the time. People, but the but, problem is, is that I'm not hearing... A word about homosexuality or a word about feminism. He had women disciples. He had women followers who were... I mean, he was... So they're not just... Cherry, the problem is, look, here's the problem. Everybody's cherry-picking, and the wider public is just is just choosing which store to buy their cherries from. Well, th thank you very much for the answer there. I am... Um, I'm sure we can discuss it again at another time at your convenience. And it sounds like it's a, harmful, it's a harmful book. And if if you, I will say that if you take it, like read it in the 21st century and read it word for word and implement all of its views, it can be harmful. It can also be helpful. It's the Bible who says that the most important thing is to love your neighbor. It doesn't say to oppress your neighbor or to stone your homosexual neighbor. It says to love your neighbor. It says to love your enemy. Well, at the risk of traversing the same ground, I'm, I'm, I appreciate the answer. Thank you very much. So you, you mentioned earlier that the problem of evil, or should we say the problem of suffering, has played a considerable role in your departure from Christianity. But as you're aware, there are many defences, the Odysseys, that claim to dissolve your worries. I'd like to ask you a few questions that relate to these defences. So let's begin with the free will defence. So some will argue that evil is a necessary consequence of free will, that God gave humans the ability to choose and evil was the result of those choices. Uh, what's your response to this defense? What do you make of it? Well, it makes, you know, when I was a Christian, that's what I thought too. And it, make, it certainly makes sense. It doesn't explain why um, 30,000 Colombians got killed in a mudslide one time or why, you know, it doesn't explain lots of evil in the world. It doesn't explain why, it doesn't explain why people die in hurricanes. It doesn't explain birth defects. It doesn't explain natural evil. But if you want to, if you want to make the argument, well, some evil, though, it can be explained by free will. Of course, I mean, I would agree with that. If I decide to punch you in the face, I mean, there's, you know, I can do that, of course. So it's my, that would be my free will. Of course, Phyllis, um, you know, I don't know how philosophically, you know, I mean, there, there are a lot of philosophers who, who talk about free will and doubt whether there is such a thing. So we're, we won't go there. But as far as that defense goes, that makes sense. But here's the point that I usually make to somebody who brings that up. It's usually a Christian who says, look, we have free will, so of course we can harm each other. And you have to be, otherwise you're programmed as, as a computer. So I usually ask them, do you think that people will have free will in heaven? And they always say yes. I said, do you think there will be evil in heaven? They say no. So I say, so it's not impossible to have a world with free will without evil. You know what? I'm starting to think that you might be the Lord and Savior because I've listed my three favorite responses. And it's uh, natural evil, determinism and free will, because as you pointed out, um, libertarian free will is very unpopular among um, philosophers these days. And as you said, free will and heaven. Yeah, no, it's um, fair enough. You, it's very clear that you've thought long and hard about this defense. So allow me to get to a second theodicy. The soul-making theodicy. This perspective suggests that suffering and evil exist to facilitate spiritual growth and development, essentially making souls. It posits that through experiencing, uh, yeah, through experiencing and overcoming adversity, individuals develop virtues and moral character. What do you make of this theodicy? Uh, well, like the other one, I think there's some truth in it. I mean, I can say that in my life, uh, a number of things that were very, very difficult for me um, from illness to bad um, to bad things happening to me to difficult economic difficult financial difficult I mean things happened to me that made me stronger uh, and so that is absolutely right. There are about ten thousand children in the world who starve to death every day. I don't think that's making them stronger. I don't think it's developing the soul. So it's very easy for somebody who's kind of a upper middle class white guy in America like me to go on about how I've been made stronger by my suffering, which I have been. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't make sense of the real suffering in the world, in my view. 
No, that's a great objection. I um I have that up there with the the concept of eternal damnation. So, um, if you take the lake of fire kind of hell, then the idea that some people will go to hell forever just seems to really run in the face of this soul making theodicy. And likewise, you know, like an infinite reward for a finite um act that seems very just not conducive, not not seeming to line up with an all powerful, all loving God. So that's two of the Odysseys you've managed, uh, uh, defences you've managed to hit aside. Let's see how you do with this one. So um, the eschatological of the Odyssey, so the eschatological of the Odyssey, also known as the heavenly reward of the Odyssey, it suggests that all suffer- suffering and evil in this life will be compensated in the afterlife. So those 10,000 children you just mentioned dying, they're just going to get compensated in the afterlife. God's going to go, here you go, guys. I know that, that was a little inconvenient, but, you know, it's all good. I'm all powerful, all loving. I know what I'm doing. How would you respond to this theodicy? That theodicy is usually is often used in the monotheistic religions, um, and so I had a uh, I had an online debate a while ago that made me. I rarely get really angry at somebody during a debate, but this one made me angry. When, when I do get angry, it's usually about theodicy. This fellow was was a Muslim, and he was using this afterlife argument that well, you know, people will be rewarded later. You know, if your child starves to death, um, she'll be given. She'll be taken to heaven. I said, "Oh, really?" I said, "Now, is that true for uh, for just Muslim girls?" Oh, well, yeah, I'm just talking about Muslims. And so, you know, most of the world's not Muslim. Um, so, uh, about eight, you know, seven, eight billion people in the world, and maybe not quite two million billion. Or so, you mean like if the ten thousand who die, like nine thousand five hundred of them are not Muslim, they're going to go to hell. Oh, yeah, they'll go to hell. <laughs> well, then how are they being rewarded for their suffering exactly? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yep, no, I'm, I'm I'm with you. It's just so facile. It's like, oh, it's okay, you know, you'll be fine. <laughs> Suck it up. <laughs> really? There's there's humanity for you. <laughs> wow, you are you are burning through these. Uh, truly a scholar. I have. Um, ha- ha- let's see how you do with this one. This this is the one that annoys me the most. Skeptical theism. So this pr- approach teaches that humans cannot understand God's reasons for allowing evil and suffering. Um, how how precisely do you respond to that type of theodicy? So it's it's essentially saying that look, anything you're looking at that looks like evil, you don't know it's evil. You don't know God's mind. You know you've got to be skeptical of these things. Maybe it is for the best. Um, I think there are two ways. There are obviously a huge range of ways of doing this particular argument. One way I think is probably the best anybody can do if they're a theist. Uh, most of the ways are not. Um, most of the ways of using that argument is to say is to stop thinking about it. Look, don't use your head. God, you know, you can't outsmart God. This is what God decides, and just still put up with it because you know you're acting like you can be God. And so don't use your brain. And I find that really offensive. Uh, I mean, if God, even if you're a theist, if you think God gave you a brain, presumably he meant you to use it, not to stick it aside. And so, you know, to use this kind of brainless idea, well, okay, God's smarter than you. Look, I'm not doubting that God would be smarter than me. I'm, I'm doubting whether there's a God. <laughs> and so, uh, so that, so I, I think that's dumb, but I do know, I do know some, um, some smart, very smart Christians who just, they don't do it like that. They just wrestle with the problem. And in the end, they say, look, I don't know. I mean, I, I've got, I believe there's a God. I just, I believe there is. And I, I don't have an answer for you. And I respect that um, because, you know, there are things I don't have. I don't have an answer for with my scientific view of the world. There are a billion things I don't have an answer for. I think there will be an answer. You know, I don't no, I don't know. Are we in a multiverse or not? I mean, how do I know what, you know, or does it even, does it make, does it make sense to talk about before the Big Bang? Probably not. But I mean, you know, so I, there, there's eight, you know, there's trillions of things we don't know. And uh, for, I think it's fine for somebody who is a, uh, for a Christian to say, I don't know, if they do it with humility and just say they generally don't know, instead of saying, oh yeah, you know, and they come up with some facile answer to it. <laughs> I always appreciate that myself, and it, as someone that interacts with apologists quite regularly, I mean, their job is to defend the faith, so it's not a surprise that they don't normally bite that humble bullet that you were just mentioning, but I always respect respect the hell out of it. I think it's a wonderful thing to say. What it, it's, it's like being able to say, look, that point that you've raised there, that is hard, okay? I, I can't 
I can't give you a definitive answer on that. However, I remain convinced because of X, Y, and Z over here. That's a perfectly, perfectly rational position. That's, that's, that's great. It's just when you get someone that's like, no, I have all the answers to everything. You, that's a really big sign that you've got an ideologue on your hands. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that gets me on skeptical theism, and I want to, I'm wondering whether, what your thoughts are on this, is essentially a moral um, paralysis. So if we're going to say that we don't know God's reasons for allowing suffering, um, we might be paralyzed in our moral decision making. So say that we see like those 10,000 children suffering, I and I have the ability to save them. Under this rubric, because I've bit this bullet in order to have an answer to the theodicy, um, to the problem of evil, I'm absolutely rational in saying, yeah, I'm not going to save them at all because I don't know God's ways. Like maybe that is for the best and me intervening is a bad thing. Um, do you think that that criticism has has emphasis or do you not prefer do you prefer not to use that one uh, i don't use it and the only reason i don't i think you know i think it's absolutely right i mean i think you're right <laughs> especially with the but it, it kind of coincides with the idea that they'll be rewarded in the in the afterlife and so then, well why bother to help them now and but, but, but in terms of, kind of being morally frozen i think that the, the people who have that view tend to be monotheists again, and monotheists tend to have biblical writings, and the biblical writings are quite clear that you need to help those in need, and you need to even give your life for others. And so, so anybody who's using that as an excuse not to help is, in fact, not being true to their own religion. I wonder if you could say, if you're taking skeptical theism seriously, then you actually don't know why God's conveyed that to you or if indeed it is God that's conveyed that to you through the scriptures. And so your skepticism should should keep you in a state of paralysis. It's an interesting dialect, uh, dialect, uh, dialectic yeah, that um, I mean, perhaps I mean, isn't I best. I think logically it's a very interesting problem. On the practical level, I've never known anybody like that in my life. Yeah, I guess that's kind of like the point of it. You point out that, listen, you can't say that you hold this view and that you and you don't consistently act this way. That tells me that you don't actually hold this view. Um, or you need, as you just said, you need some kind of breaker to explain why in this case it's, you can actually intervene, such as references to the scripture. So the last of the uh, theodicies I want to discuss, before we move on to other questions, depending on your time, is the best of all possible worlds theodicy, the OG, if, if you will. You know, the, the perspective famously proposed by Leibniz, suggesting that God has created the best of all possible worlds, and that just includes the existence of evil. Whether or not it's actually gratuitous is another question. Uh, what are your thoughts to that general theodicy? Well, my thoughts are that anybody who holds that theodicy ought to read Candide. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Slap him about with Voltaire. Voltaire nailed that one to the wall, <laughs> I think, in my opinion. I think that... I think look, I think it's nuts to say that this is the best of all possible worlds. I had a I had a I had three times I had a public debate with Dinesh D'Souza. I don't know if you would know who that is. I do. I do, unfortunately. Yeah. So on the on this problem of theodicy, and his his big argument was that God had to allow for suffering because the world has to have tectonic plates. Because if you don't have tectonic plates, you wouldn't have what was needed for life to be to come into existence. And so God had to create a world with tectonic plates, uh, because otherwise there couldn't be life here. And if you have tectonic plates, you're going to have earthquakes and uh, volcanoes and nasty things. <laughs> and, it's like, and when he says things like that, I just think, are you crazy? Yeah. You mean you're saying that the. the Almighty God, you're, you're saying that God is almighty, is an all-powerful, and he cannot create life without a tectonic plate? He needs a tectonic plate? <laughs> that makes the tectonic plate stronger than God. <laughs> what are you talking about? So, look, you, look I, don't, I don't know you very well, but I bet you could design a world where there aren't 10,000 children dying every, every day, you know, or, or you know, I, I mean, and to think that that's necessary right? It's necessary for this to be the perfect world. These massive, I mean, birth defects and accidents and, I mean, war. I was like, what? That's the best? Surely anybody could come up with better than this. Yeah, no, I, I, I really feel your passion there. I, I agree. When I, hear, when I hear the best of all possible worlds, it, it genuinely, I, I, my eyes roll and I just think, my goodness, like, the idea that we are created in God's image, no less, and the way that he chose to achieve this is to have at least 14 billion years of essentially nothing of us turning up. 
all of this accretion, all of this destruction, mass extinctions taking away 90 odd percent of creatures each, you know, sorry dinosaurs, you're just unnecessary, we need, we need fossil for, for our cars. Um, all of this happening just so that we can stand here and receive his message, it strikes me as absolutely insane. So like, while I would never say that Christians are insane, anyone that holds that this is the best of all possible worlds, to me, is being profoundly irrational. And um, irrational and, and hard-hearted because I mean, look, if everybody had my life, I would I would agree. Yeah, this is a pretty damn good world, <laughs> you know. But the reality is, people just close their eyes and ears to the real. You know, I had a I had a I had a public debate one time with a fellow New Testament scholar, N. T. Wright, Tom Wright, and and he had this kind of kind of global view about how God was working in history and that the, the Bible is this kind of narrative of how it's all going to end up great. And, and he, so he didn't see the problem of suffering. And I kept st just citing statistics at him, you know, you know, child starves to death every seven seconds. And, you know, every day 300 people die of malaria and X number die. And, and in the debate, he says, but I just don't understand why Bart's throwing all these, all this suffering in our face. <laughs> We're debating why this happens. You can't debate what happens if you don't admit it's happening. <laughs> I'm telling you now, man. If you're debating suffering and you bring up suffering, that's a, that's that's not a fair move. Don't do that. Don't throw it in my face. I just want to talk about God's glorious plan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what they wanted. Next question. You've titled your course "Why I Am Not a Christian: How Leaving the Faith Led Me uh, Led Led to a Life of More Meaning and Purpose." Would you mind sharing a specific example of how leaving Christianity has enriched your life in a way that you might not have, uh, that isn't in fact possible, should you have remained in the faith? Um, well, you know, it may have been possible, but I, but I think now that I think that this is it, this, this is it. I mean, as you said, you know, some, some kind of a big bang happened about 14 billion years ago and life showed up about four and a half billion years ago. And, and, you know, and so we, we are, when you start thinking in terms of 14.5, you know, whatever billion years and for 4.5 billion years of the earth, and you start thinking in terms of a galaxy with a hundred billion stars or whatever, and, you know, maybe hundred billion, maybe two trillion star galaxies in the world, you start thinking about like the finiteness of our existence. Um, and you realize this is all there is for me. It makes me, since I don't believe in any eternity, I don't believe there's life after death. I think this life is all there is. Grasping that means that I grasp the importance of relishing what I've got. Um, it's not a dress rehearsal. It's not getting ready for the next thing. This is it. And for me, that recognition didn't lead to any kind of nihilistic uh, despair. It led to a sense that I need to to really enjoy life and relish it. And I need to help other people who can't do that uh, enjoy life as well. And so for me, it made me more human. You know, I, so, I, you know, I'm a humanist. I'm, I, I really believe in being as fully human as I can. Well, amen to that. That's a, that's a great takeaway from it. And yeah, it's something that's quite unique to this, if you will, view that this is your only go. Do your best. That's your legacy. Um, yeah, great, great answer. So how do you respond to those that say that you are misinterpreting the Bible and taking it out of context? Um, I'm happy to hear, you know, why they think so. I think that interpreting the Bible is a historical enterprise. I think it's it's a matter of, of deep literary study and uh, putting the Bible in its own historical context, uh, understanding what that context is, and being able to read read it very carefully as an ancient piece of literature. Uh, to do that, you need to be able to read it in its original language. So my focus is the New Testament, so you have to be uh, competent in being able to read the New Testament in Greek, um, and you need to understand Greek syntax and grammar and and uh, vocabulary of course and and you need to understand the greek and the the roman world in which it appeared so it takes years and years of study to get to a point where you're able really to uh, study this literature just like it takes years and years to study you know you know homer or anybody anyone else from the ancient world so anyone who you know who disagrees with interpretations I have. I'm always happy to talk about it because I I'm rarely bound to any of my interpretations. I mean I don't have I don't really have a horse in the race anymore. Um, 
And so uh, it's a matter of going back and forth and deciding who's got the better interpretation. I rarely have interpretations that are unique to me. When it comes to biblical interpretation, I don't think I've, I can't think of anything I've interpreted in terms of understanding the text that, that I came up with. No, fair enough. Well, on the studying front and, you know, knowing what's being said, if you could change one thing about how religious studies are taught, what would it be? How religious studies are taught or how theology is taught? See, in our country, it's a different. It's less so in, in England. Um, in England, schools, religious studies and theology are, are melded a little bit more than they are. In America, religious studies is usually understood to be a secular discipline within a university. I see. And theological studies are done within divinity schools and seminaries that are training ministers. Um, so religious studies, I don't really have any problem with. Religious studies in America is a really interesting phenomenon because it's a, it is a multi, um, multidisciplinary field. So I've got 20 colleagues in my, my department, religious studies at a secular university, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I have colleagues who teach Judaism and Islam and, and Buddhism and American religion and ancient Christianity and Reformation studies and study that we all, but we all teach about religion. And some of us are anthropologists, trained as anthropologists. Some are linguists, philologists. Some are historians. Some are literary scholars. Some are philosoph philosophers. And so they're approaching religious studies from these various perspectives. And I have no problem with that at all. It's just one of the, one of the um, humanities, one of the liberal arts. So it sounds like you're, you're pretty happy with how that's taught. Yeah. So I want to move into the moral sphere slightly. How do you engage with moral and ethical questions in the absence of your religious framework? Has leaving Christianity changed your perspective on all things morality? Um, so I think I think the basic answer to that is no. <laughs> I mean, just my my morality is very different from when I was a fundamentalist Christian, where I was taking everything literally, and where I was trained in fundamentalist ways of understanding uh, morality. Um, which I think is a very can be a very harmful thing. And you brought up uh, issues of sexuality. In fundamentalist Christianity, of course, homosexuals are all completely condemned. Uh, and um, even, you know, I mean, sex before marriage, completely condemned. When I was at Moody Bible Institute, everybody was basically getting married when they were 20 or 21 because there's the only way you could legitimately have sex. <laughs> and so it's like you couldn't. <laughs> and so, you know, that, that's not, it's not really that, healthy to be married to people when you're 20 you know it's like i mean it can be it can be my first marriage i was 20. But, but but i'm just saying that you know there there are there's very repressed sexuality that's a, that's a very big thing in some parts of christian not just fundamentalism but in in many kinds of roman catholicism and so forth um and so when it comes to things like sexual ethics i have a very in all in in virtually every ethical issue and every social issue i have a very liberal uh, perspective that I did not have as a as a fundamentalist, but my perspectives are shared by many liberal Christians, um, and so my the the my 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 closest friends tend to be Christians, and we share social and political views up and down the line, uh, even though they're Christian and I'm not. Got you. So, I think I'll conclude on this question. You you quoted Jesus as saying. Truly, I tell you, some of you standing here will not taste uh, before you see the kingdom of God um, come in power. So how is it that you interpret this statement? I know that you've written before about Jesus expressing that it, it's going to happen in, in his lifetime, or sorry, in, in, in that generation. Would you mind expanding upon that, please? Yeah, that's um, so, you know, it's not a view that's unique to me. This is a view that's mm. it's. Among historical scholars in uh, in the United States and in Europe, where most of the Christian you know scholarship is done, most of it, um, this has been the dominant view, the, the majority view among critical scholars for over a century now. Uh, most popularized by Albert Schweitzer um, in 1906 in his book *The Quest of the Historical Jesus*, that Jesus was predicting the imminent end of the of the world as we know it, that God was soon to intervene and destroy the powers of evil that are making life so miserable here and to bring in a good a good kingdom. Uh, Jesus appears to have thought he'd be the king of this future kingdom. And he told his disciples what other other apocalyptic Jews in Jesus' day were saying, which is, we're, we're at the end. It's going to be any time now. 
And Jesus did tell his disciples, according to the New Testament, and I think he himself actually did say this, that, that some of them would not taste death before they saw it happen, that this generation, his own generation, would not pass away before these things took place. I think Jesus genuinely believed he was living at the end of the age, just as people have since then, and just as millions of people still think uh, today. Um, and he was obviously wrong about that. So he didn't care. <laughs> So, <laughs> when you've got lots of people that interpret it differently, so they say, no, Jesus wasn't saying that. Do you think that you're on a more scripturally sound position than them? Or do you think it's just you're all you're both equal in your views? No, they're not equal in our views. I mean, does Jesus mean what he says or not? But earlier on, when we're speaking about stoning a man and a man being together, it sounded like you was saying that people are equal in their views. You don't need it's not about the words on the paper. It's about the beliefs that the people have and what they're imbuing into the Bible. Can you explain what the symmetry breaker is here? Well, well there's no symmetry. I mean, I was talking about, I mean, for one thing, you asked about homosexuality. But I, but I, I did, I I did said, refine that to ma a man lying with a man. I don't really care about the term homosexuality yeah. at the end of the day. Well, it's two males being killed. I think, I think Jesus is wrong and I think that law is wrong. So what's the, uh, what's the as symmetry? a Christian though, if if you read it, you I, I would assume that you'd think that that's a correct position that's expressed in the Bible, and you would you would say, look, yeah. read it, it says it, just as you would say here, look, Jesus said he's going to come back in his lifetime. So those that say yeah. that no 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 he meant it in a vague way, you could stand there and say, listen, my position is is scripturally supported more than yours, uh, but it sounded like earlier you were rejecting the entire notion of having a scriptural one-up on someone else because it's all about people imbuing their own biases. No, no, I think you misunderstood me. I think you misunderstood me. Um, we didn't get into the interpretation of the Leviticus passage when you and I were talking about it. There are, so what, so what I would, what I point, I mean, if we had an interpretation of the Leviticus passage, you, uh, what I would argue is that if you put it in its own historical context, you realize it isn't applicable to our historical context. So you read it literally within its own historical context. That's exactly what I do with the words of Jesus. In his own histor in its own historical context, Leviticus is definitely saying you need to stone somebody, a man who sleeps with a man. Oh right, okay. But, yeah, but that's not what that that the question is. What's that got to do with me? <laughs> if I sleep with a man, I mean, am I, you, you know, are Christians supposed to stone me to death? Uh, and so, uh, so. I'm saying when you put it in a different context, the applicability is different. That doesn't mean that it didn't do that in its context. In Jesus' context, he absolutely meant that it's coming, you know, so very soon in his generation. Okay. So Christians enough. can absolutely say, yes, that is what he said. It didn't come true. And and liberal Christians would say, so, you know, he got the calendar wrong. Or, or he meant it, you know, you'd come up with some other explanation. But I, my personal view is that Jesus really said it. He really meant it. It didn't happen. And so it was a mistake. Well, on that bombshell, I will just say to everyone watching, please check the link below and you can see Bioman's um, course on why I am not a Christian, how leaving the faith led to a life of more meaning and more purpose. Thank you, Bart. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate your your, your scholarly presence, especially where you've, you've interacted with people on YouTube, such as myself and many others. Uh, there's lots of people that speak very highly of you and they relish the opportunity to have discussions like we're having right now and like I have as well. So thank you very, very much for your time. Well, thank you. This has been a, this has been a really interesting one. <laughs> You've got good questions. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. Thank you.